All right, I think, uh, I think we'll get started. How's everybody doing? Last talk before lunch. Delicious barbecue, I hope. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk about GitHub. Uh, how many of you guys are GitHub users or have used GitHub? Awesome. Um, so my name's Kyle Daigle. You can hit me up on Twitter at kdaigle or on GitHub at kdaigle. If you have any comments or questions, um, hopefully I'll have enough time to answer a bunch of questions at the end. Um, but if anything comes up, just hit me up here and I'm happy to go over anything with you. Um, so this is github.com. Uh, you know, most of us nowadays are using it mainly for open source stuff, but uh, I kind of wanted to start with the story of GitHub. And like any good story, GitHub's story starts in a bar. So GitHub started with Tom Preston Warner. Uh, he was running a Ruby group, basically, and in a bar he was sitting there and ended up talking to Chris about a project he was working on called Grit. And Grit was the first Ruby library to work with Git at the time. Um, and so this is kind of when Git was starting to get hot over Subversion and some of the other options. Uh, and so they started working on this uh, completely on the side uh, and ended up wanting to make a very easy way to do Git hosting because there really wasn't any easy way to do Git hosting at the time. So they started working on weekends and Saturdays and then uh, on the end there, PJ ended up joining them because uh, he was working at a startup with Chris. Uh, they all had full-time jobs but ultimately got together because of Git. Uh, and so uh, how, how many Git users day to day are there? Awesome. So, so for version control, um, it, mainly before Git, most people use Subversion. Um, and there's other options uh, as well. But Git was sort of, uh, Git started in 2005 and then got really big. Uh, and a lot of people use it now in the open source community especially uh, because it was a non-proprietary version of BitKeeper, which is what Linus Torvald built it off of. Um, the cool thing I think is that anyone can act as a host for Git. So your repository can be a host for Git just like GitHub's is. Um, and so they built this for a couple months working on the weekends and GitHub launched in April 10th of 2008, so just about five years ago. Um, open source has always been free, private repositories have been paid, um, and the founders paid themselves as they made uh, revenue goals. GitHub's been bootstrapped at the very beginning. They took a, we took a round last year uh, to help us grow, but we've been profitable uh, since, since the start. Uh, we used what worked well for us at the beginning. We were hosted on Engine Yard. Um, and then as we outgrew that, we replaced it with our uh, own, uh, own hardware uh, and whatever sort of worked. And that's the huge thing that GitHub's really passionate about is not really jumping to the really complex stuff at the very beginning. It's sort of figuring out what can we get by with at the start. And so as they outgrew, they moved on to a new platform. At the very beginning, GitHub didn't have an office. Uh, it was a small group of six or eight employees. Uh, they worked out of coffee shops, people's houses. Um, Hubbers really like to travel, and especially at the very beginning, the founders like to travel quite a bit. And so it was very hard to have hours. So there was no real hours at GitHub. Everyone sort of worked whenever they worked best. Uh, you couldn't really acquire hours because there wasn't really an office. So fast forward to today, GitHub uh, just turned five years old a month or two ago. Um, we have 3.6 million users and 7 million repositories. Um, for our products, if you're not familiar, we obviously have github.com. We have GitHub Enterprise, which is if you work in a uh, company that needs to have everything behind the firewall, you can do that. And we have GitHub Training. We can train you on Git, uh, as well as GitHub Jobs. So for us, our stack is basically all in Ruby. Um, most of our stuff runs Ruby and Rails. Uh, we use Sinatra a lot for the API. We use SAS for CSS pre-compilation. Uh, we use ERB for our templating. Um, our servers are Unicorn. Uh, managed by Puppet, MySQL, Redis, Memcache, kind of like the greatest hits of technology right now. Um, and we use Jekyll for uh, static site compilation. Uh, but the cool thing at GitHub is every team ends up choosing their own stack. So if one of us decides that we prefer to work, say, in Go for some sort of awesome backend thing or Node.js, um, that's also an option. Uh, if you haven't used GitHub personally, I'd really invite you to check out GitHub for Mac or GitHub for PC. Um, essentially, it's just an easier way, especially for non-technology savvy folks like product managers, et cetera, to be able to track on what, what you're working on if you're using a, Git -backed, uh, a GitHub backed uh, repository. So that's kind of just, if you don't know anything about GitHub or don't know the story, that's the preamble. So now on to the juicy stuff. What I'm really here to talk about is our culture and how we use that to build everything that we build. So I like to call it the trifecta because it really comes down to three main things. 
optimizing for happiness. And this is like the biggest phrase you'll probably hear if you hear like press releases from Tom, the CEO, or anything. The big thing for us is it's not just making you guys happy, it's making ourselves happy. Like not choosing technology that like sucks to work with or isn't a joy to use every day. We want to create super fans. We want people to take our stickers and you love GitHub so much, you're going to put them on your laptop, like the most crucial space for technology people to say, see, there you go, to see what they have. And I have a bunch of stickers up here too and a bunch of other stuff when, uh, when we're done. So optimize for happiness is number one. The second thing is first principles. And this again is something that Tom, the CEO, really pushes. Basically, it's thinking that a lot of times in technology, you get a problem, and the first thing you think of is, oh, I know how to solve that. That's, I just need to loop over this and store it in the database. Or, oh, you need a CRM system for a sales team. Okay, we're gonna go call Salesforce or whatever. The big thing here is figuring out what's unique to us or you and making sure you take that into consideration when you're working and building something. The third thing is taste. We want people that want to build something that's beautiful, simple, tasteful to use. Um, not necessarily will it make us more money. You know, we want to make sure that we enjoy using it just as much as you guys do. So now I'm going to basically go through very specific scenarios where culture makes our lives happier and hopefully you, your all's lives happier too. Um, something I think that's unique is we don't make the bet that the development team is going to drive the culture. Culture is its own thing. It's on top of everything. Development, designers, business people, operations people, everything. And it informs everything we work. So first, for happiness is where you are. Uh, more than half of GitHub is remote. We have 179 employees as of this week. Um, over 60% of them are remote. Uh, a lot of people work at home. Um, there's a, a headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, we have destinations, uh, trips, camping, you name it, everything. People can go anywhere and live anywhere they want. Uh, all of our presentations at uh, HQ are live streamed, so any employee can tune in and basically watch what's going on uh, at that time. So it's really cool. I live in Connecticut, so I'm totally not on the right coast. Austin is totally awesome and much better than Connecticut. But aside from that, when I can't go to uh, HQ and see someone present on like a Friday afternoon, it's all live stream. It's really cool and everyone's in chat. So this is a cool project that Marcus, one of our developers, did. Basically, he took Google Earth and took GitHub Team, which is an internal app I'll show you later, and basically plotted out all the hubbers uh, that, where they are at that time. And it's cool, 3D, you can go and you can zoom and do all the cool stuff Google Earth does. Uh, same thing for, for Europe, because we have people all over. And then he ended up actually attaching it to this really cool touch screen we have in the office and a 3D uh, joystick at the very bottom, which can do every direction. So we put it there so people like to come in when they visit. You can find your house and see like where we've done a drink up near you or anything like that. Because of all this remoteness, we're totally asynchronous. We don't do meetings. We don't do anything that requires people at the same time. I'm a, I'm a new hubber, so I know how that sounds totally crazy on the other side of things, it takes a lot of work to do it this way. You know, we're, take, we're making a bet that asynchronous is going to be the way it's going to work as we go into a more global, global workforce. So the important thing for this is we have to log everything we do. Every communication, every issue we do, every repository. Uh, John Maddox, one of the developers at GitHub, likes to say everything needs a URL. You can't do anything at GitHub without being able to show someone what you did, what you said, what you meant, what you tweeted, whatever. You should always be able to go back and read. It's a huge part of our culture. So one of the things we have here, this is, uh, this is an internal app we have called Team. It's sort of like an internal Twitter. You can basically share anything you want on here. You can see on the left, we can share ideas. We can, do, um, we can see where the hubbers live, vision, documentation. It's really important. But this is only for us right now. We, have, we also have a Mac app for it, an Android app, an iOS app, um, and that's all just built for our internal work because we weren't able to find something that worked well for us, so we had to go out and build it ourselves. Along with that is chat. Chat is absolutely huge for us. Um, we have a ton of rooms. Uh, we use uh, Campfire by 37 Signals with a sort of beefed up uh, Propane, which is a Mac app that was uh, released. We kind of hacked through some of the JavaScript backend stuff. So you can do like things like mentions. Um, when you paste things, we'll do like emoji. And so you can kind of see some of this stuff. This is just in um, the room I'm in. 
uh, they are testing out a Hubot script. And so Hubot is our pretty fancy uh, chatbot. And so it started off kind of as a silly thing, being able to paste in images, being able to say mustache me, and it'll take any image and it'll put a mustache on the person's face, silly things like that. But it actually really, really, really grew. And so we ended up open sourcing it. So you can actually go to github.com and download this. It's just called Hubot. If you use Campfire, IRC, HipChat, I think there's all connectors. It's very easy to write an adapter if you run something um, special. Uh, but basically, you can go in, and there's a huge library of scripts that we use. And so we call this chat ops. We can, do, we can start up and shut down servers from this. We can graph basically any piece of information that we need from this. And the cool thing for the operations folks, one of which I'm not, is when something does go wrong, and you use Hubot to do all this, the transcript actually shows you basically your post-mortem. So instead of looking at like a Nagios or, or something that's going to graph everything for you for the more operation-minded folks, this will actually do that, but it'll also save the images permanently. So you can read back and see, OK, I made a decision based on this information here, instead of trying to do that you know, backwards after something bad happens um, with GitHub. Because we get uh, you know, DDoS'd all the time now. <laughs> so this is Hubot. I just wanted to show you a simple script. So Hubot is built in CoffeeScript, um, which is a JavaScript uh, uh, pre-compilation library. So this is just a really simple example. Uh, so you can see robot and Hubot is the robot. And Hubot's just going to respond to a very simple thing when we say, Hubot, have a beer. And so we were able to store a bunch of information inside his brain, basically. And then we can do very simple things here, like you know, say, OK, sure, I'll have another beer, or I'm too drunk. This is a very simple example. But you can imagine hitting maybe an internal API of yours, or a puppet, or something external to get more and more information. So it's one of those things that sounds really silly to like worry about your chat bot and see what he's up to. But we can literally do everything from chat. So pull requests. Pull requests are huge for us. Um, a lot of the open source projects, we run very similarly to them. Anytime I work on anything at GitHub, I have to issue a pull request. And so we use a really, really simple um, branching uh, uh, tactic. Essentially, master for GitHub is always deployable. We don't have like a production branch or anything like that. Master is always what goes out. We break off a feature branch to work on whatever we're particularly working on at that time. Once the feature is done, it goes into master. And then we can always keep master up to date as we go. And so this is basically it. This isn't that interesting. This is just how we work. Um, but simple makes it very easy to just deploy all the time. right? So this is a sample pull request that um, is in the project that I'm working on. I work for uh, an internal t uh, business tools team. So basically, anyone that is in finance, HR, anything like that, I'm the one that helps make their lives a lot easier and not crappy like most poor finance accountant and so on people are because their software always sucks. It always sucks. So we're trying to fix that. So you can see a very simple thing. At GitHub, every project, we have a contribution guideline. So basically, any developer or designer can take a look and see if they want to make a very simple tweak. They just have to read a very simple um, document saying what we expect of you when you want to put code into this project. So you can see I put this in. Some people responded. And then, and then anyone in the company can come in and actually chat with us about this and say what they think, what we're missing, what we're not doing very well. The cool thing about this that I think is awesome is that Everyone at GitHub works this way. The operations guy that stocks the fridge, the office manager, the uh, PR people, everybody. And so we have a GitHub gear repository that only works with issues. We don't have any code in there. But what we do is if I need a laptop, I go in, I set an issue, and then the person whose job it is to buy that laptop for me goes in and works off that issue. It always works that way. Then they can go in, and if they need to decide, OK, in order to ask for a laptop, you need to do XYZ. Then they can make a readme and just do it right there without having to deal with Git or the command line or anything. And so I think this is one of the biggest hacks that GitHub does. We don't separate tech projects or tech stuff from non-tech people. There's not like, OK, the project managers need to be in Basecamp, and all the developers are going to be in Jira. And when Jira gets confusing, we're going to put some more information into a newsletter or whatever. We make it, re it's really important for us that everyone can work in one project, because that way we can mention you, we can bring you into something, and we're never worried about, oh, you know, um, 
the project manager isn't getting this or the designer doesn't have this because they don't work in JIRA or, or whatever the tools are that you use. Um, so a lot of our repositories are just issues. They don't actually have code in them. It's just a way to organize uh, discussion about something. So you can kind of see here at the end, some people came in. If you do a pull request, it's your responsibility to merge it in. This is effectively our code review. Um, we don't have anyone else that's kind of managing that or there's not some manager that needs to come in and check that out. So I put it in, a bunch of people will come in and comment on it, and then ultimately it gets merged. So at GitHub, it's essentially a consensus. So normally, if it's a very small thing, for example, this, con this country, he, sorry, he also asked, how do you know when it's ready to be merged? So when you, for this very small document, John was the other team member. He came in, said, yep, I waited the for the rest of the day. Some other people came in and said, hey, did you look at this? Did you look at that? And I merged it. And so for things that are a little bit more substantial, like an entire feature, an API, or something like that, usually you want the people on your team and then maybe a couple people from outside your team to respond. So there's not a rule that says one or two people that need to respond, it, to, respond to it. It's really um, specific to whatever you're working on. Because no one wants to be the one that merged in the thing that took github.com down, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. So in Git, um, when you work on something, we branch off from master. So when you make a feature, oops, I'm sorry. So when you make a feature and you do that branch off, instead of just merging it in back into master, we go, we issue a pull request. This is a github.com feature, I guess you could say. And so we take that branch and say, I want to be able to take this and merge it back to master. Before I do that, here's exactly what I worked on. Yeah, it's saying pull this code back into master for me. And then once it gets approved, essentially, at the very bottom, I can merge it. And then it'll, be, it'll say John Magic, my teammate, is it'll say it's closed out. So I'm asking here, this is the pull request. It's just one document. It's just a contributing.markdown file. And so I'm saying, here it is. This is how to contribute to Finance Web. I mentioned a couple people that I wanted to make sure saw this. And then they'll go through and they'll read it. And then essentially at the end here, you'll see he comes in and says, OK, I'm going to let this wait a couple days just to make sure everyone saw it. And then, then we merged it in. So it's a way of making sure everyone sees your code without kind of sneaking in a bug or anything. Yeah? Yeah. No. Even if it's a bug or something that's really major, there's always someone around. Even if they're not from your team, there's always another developer or designer or operations person that you can ping and chat and say, hey, I need you to come check this out right now. Um, so the kind of sibling to pull requests is just issues. This is, this is our issue tracker. Um, so this is just an example of all the stuff that I'm working on right now uh, with my teammates. Essentially, everything is, everything is mentionable to each other. So I mentioned the whole URL thing. If you, if you do a pull request, um, you can mention an issue, and they'll close out simultaneously. Um, same thing with an issue. If you go in an issue and something is uh, important from either another repository or from your own repository from another issue, all of those can be mentioned. So sometimes in projects, you'll have a base a base repository that does most of what you need, and then things get bolted on or modules in the Drupal community. You'd be able to mention across all that to be able to say, hey, this other module is working on XYZ. What do we think about that? And so that's, this is probably the most important part of um, how we work at GitHub in terms of collaborating and understanding where our code is. From a culture perspective, we travel a lot. Um, we travel for talks like this one. Um, vacation summits twice a year. The entire company flies out to San Francisco. Um, we can do mini summits where your team goes out to San Francisco to work together. Um, and then obviously conferences where we either attend or, or we're speaking at them. Uh, it's really big for us because it's always been that way. And so instead of trying to fight it and make everyone come in at a certain time, uh, we're able to do that because we all work asynchronously. Um, so this is a picture from the last summit um, there's a lot more employees now than there were back then. Uh, one of the other cool things I think GitHub does is uh, GitHub destinations. And what GitHub destinations are basically, GitHub gets a property and then they allow their employees to go and work there uh, as part of a team. 
And so because I don't get to see a lot of coworkers because I'm in Connecticut and I'm the only employee in Connecticut, I'm able to go to a destination and be able to see some employees that maybe I haven't met before in person or you know, we can work together on a project. So the one that's going on right now is in Portland, Maine. And I was actually here, um, I was there uh, a couple weeks ago and when I get back to Connecticut, I'm gonna drive back up and we're gonna work together. It's really quite cool. Um, it's funny though because uh, GitHub's last destination of the year is actually in Austin. Um, so they're going to be, a bunch of hubbers are going to be invading Austin, and I'm sure they're going to throw a drink up. So if you're an Austin local, look for free beer coming up <laughs> shortly. <laughs> Lots of free beer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I said, you can work where you want. Uh, you can work when you want. So a lot of people are night owls. I'm on the East Coast, and most people are on the West Coast. So I usually get my work done pretty early in the day in comparison. And so you can work when you work best. I'm a morning person. Uh, a lot of people are night owls, so when I get up, some of the West Coast people will be just going to sleep because they were hacking all night long or whatever. The cool thing, I think, is work on what you want, right? Which kind of sounds absolutely crazy, and I thought that before I joined, but it really, really works quite well. And I'm going to give an example just to explain how this works. So GitHub released code search a little while ago. Before that, um, search was really crummy at github.com. It was really hard to find something in your own repositories. And so GitHub knew that, like we knew that that was a big problem. And so what happened was is Tim decided to go, you know what, we're gonna start fixing this. And so he's a developer, he went in, installed Elasticsearch, started building out a little prototype, and then launched it to the internal team and said, hey, GitHub, this is staff shipped, which is how a lot of features work at github.com. Everything gets shipped internally first, nothing just goes out to the public. Um, we staff shipped it, ultimately it was ugly, and it needed some designer love, and so a designer that cared about it came on, John, and he ultimately decided to design out what this looked like once we had a little prototype going. And ultimately, this now becomes the search team, right? Nobody told them to work on search. It's something that we all knew was important, but somebody went out and proved it, somebody that cared about it. Like, um, if you were here yesterday, they talked a lot about, we need an internal advocate for this, and this is true, this is how this works here. Um, and so, this was staff shipped, I think, for six or eight months before it went out, and then ultimately it went out live to the public. And so if you're a github.com user, you might notice that repository next, or the new repositories came out recently, um, and that was staff shipped for, I think, six or eight months before it just went out um, last week, I think. So ultimately, these guys are basically the ones that are responsible for search. Uh, we have someone that on every team is called the primary responsible person. They're the person that usually uh, gets the questions from another team. They're the one that sort of works between everyone or if someone has to ask a question, hey, what's going on with this? They're the person you might go to. Uh, but ultimately nobody told these guys what to do. They know that they have to work together in order to get this accomplished. And so the question that I usually get asked when I mention this is, well, how do you actually like take care of business objectives? Like how do you make sure you're all working towards something that uh, is worthwhile. And I think the cool thing at GitHub is, is there's no like secret information that only a manager or a CEO or an accountant knows. Any of the information that GitHub has is disseminated to the entire company. We do weekly, uh, weekly meetings called Beer 30 on Fridays, where the CEO usually shares whatever's been going on that week or any really important information. And during that, they give us all the information that we would need to know about what's going on, what might be coming up next, maybe what, um, you know, when they took a round of funding, they would talk about that kind of stuff. And so that enables us all to make the good decisions. If you're working on something by yourself for a long time, you probably know you're not working towards a good business objective. If you can't get anyone else to work with you on something, that's a bad sign. And so that's essentially how we work on making sure that what we're working on is actually valuable. And this is pretty similar to open source, right? How many times do contributors join and leave projects? At some point, they're doing something really important that they really care about, and then eventually, after n years, they might decide that, you know what, I don't have what I can give to this project anymore. And so GitHub started from that, and we're just using that as our internal rule as well, is if a developer or designer isn't really excited about what they're working on, they should be able to move within the company, and it should be easy to do that. And that takes work, right? That takes, you have to be asynchronous, you have to document a lot of stuff, but it's really important. Because we want to make sure that like, what I'm going to wake up and want to work on is, is something I want to work on, not something I have to work on. You know, It's really important to avoid burnout. I, I mean, every job I've had before this one, 
you usually work for a project, a product, an app, a client, whatever, for a certain amount of time, and at some point you end up feeling like, okay, I never want to look at this project ever again in my life. And so my teammate, John Hoyt, he worked on Speaker Deck for a while, which is a way uh, for uh, people to, actually, to share their presentations very easily. And so this presentation's on there now. Um, he worked on that, and then eventually, after I think a year and a half or so, he got a little burnt out on that, and he decided to go work on the help team. And the help team is our internal support tool. That's how we handle all the thousands and thousands of support requests we get. Eventually, after I think two years of that, he gets a little burnt out as well and ends up going to the team I'm on, which is the finance team now, the business tools team. We're working on the finance app together. Most of the employees that have been there for four or five years have had you know, three or four jobs, right? They're able to move between teams. I don't have to really get permission. I would go start working with another team slowly and kind of on the side and then decide if that's something I want to go work on. Because people work better when they're passionate about what they're working on. You know, I know this isn't simple. I did consulting before I went to GitHub. I worked another startup before I went to GitHub. You know, and I know that it sucks sometimes when you're working on something that you don't want to be working at anymore, but you have no choice. And so I think what's cool is you know, there is a way to fix that. It just takes more work. It takes more work than just doing what you can do best and then moving on. You have to do documentation around that and give a lot of information. So onto the happiness thing. I think the Octocat has been like the weirdest but coolest thing that we've probably done in quite some time. Because we want to create super fans, the Octocat got huge. So that's her. The Octocat started just as something, it's a piece of stock art that Tom bought when he started the company. And he put it on the web page and he was like, oh, this is cool. And then every, and it blew up. Everyone just loved it. He had two. He had happy Octocat and sad Octocat. So the 500 page would be a sad Octocat. The other Octocats would be happy. And so eventually he ended up having to go to the artist and buy the rights. And so we got the rights and then like everything just went crazy. So we, I have a bunch of stickers up here, but the cool thing I think, which is kind of absolutely crazy, is we have full-time illustrators at GitHub that just work on Octocats. They do video bumpers. They do custom art. So, you get, so I'm going to show you a couple of the ones that I really like. So the one on the far uh, left is uh, the Data Cat. And the company, at some, I, don't, I don't even know who it was, but somebody ordered cards. And if you were a father this last uh, Father's Day, any father at GitHub, they got sent a Father's Day card. Some, some designer decided to print them out, I think, and send them. But yeah, these are the cool ones. And so if you want to see more of these, they're all at octadex.github.com. I think there's like 105 now. Obviously, for you guys, right, this is, I have like a ton of those up here. So please don't leave any behind. Uh, I have a bunch of other stickers, too. And so the, these are the, the latest two I'm going to show you, which I really like. Uh, they're the Daft Punk Cats, because of the new album. So these are all online. You can just download them if you, if you like them. But the cool thing is, is I mean, you know, it, 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 this, this was driven by you guys, right? I mean, we don't just make these because we think they're like neat. We make them because people really like them. You know, we have stickers. We have it. Like I have the portal, uh, the portal uh, Octocat on my laptop. Uh, but it's really neat. And it's really important because it makes people happy. And it makes me happy when I get to go to a conference and I see an Octocat on a laptop. But obviously, everything I said up to this point doesn't work if we can't hire people that work well in this, in this system. So hiring's wicked important, right? It's important to find people that are self-managed, managers of one, as a lot of blog posts always say. Um, and during that process, when you apply at GitHub, um, we have an internal app called Hire. And Hire is what manages our, you know, the entire hiring process for us. Um, everyone can come in and, and comment on people and say, yep, I've worked with them at this other company. Um, Yes, I, you know, I really liked his work when he did XYZ at you know, this other company that he worked at. Uh, so ultimately, that process starts with you know, an application, sort of, or an email, or, or someone putting this into hire. A bunch of people can comment. Um, some people might call and meet with you. And then eventually, we fly everyone to San Francisco to do a meeting in person. And so usually at that point, we believe in your technical ability. We want to make sure that you're a person that we can all work together. So that first, that first sort of meeting at the very beginning might just be uh, a phone call or a screen share with a, with a developer that you know, goes through all of the, uh, that uh, does like a quick little example pairing exercise. Same thing with designers. They do a lot of that. Uh, same thing with operations people. One of the main things we look for is we need people that ship early and ship often. 
You have to have delivered something. You can't have like a GitHub, a GitHub uh, account full of like half ship stuff or okay, I worked on this app, this side app, but I never really got it out. Like that's not really helpful to us. Uh, a lot of people that come to GitHub did uh, software as a service applications before they came here. Um, and so, you know, that's really important. You can't just be a theorist. You have to actually send something out. Another thing we look for is you have to have compatible taste. Not the same taste, but compatible taste. It's very rare for someone to come in and say, I'm only going to use Jekyll. I'm never going to use WordPress. I'm never going to use Drupal. I'm never going to use PHP. This is the only thing I work in. That's very, very rare for you to come in and be able to say that. You can say, I prefer to work in Ruby, and here's why I like it. But you can't really come in and say, I'm only going to use SAS, and that's it, right? You have to be flexible. Design should be important to you. You shouldn't come in and, as a developer and just say, you know, I don't really care what it work looks like. I just want to be able to build something out. You don't have to be able to execute on that, but you should care what the final product looks like. You may not know how to do that, but it should matter to you. And of course, having code on GitHub helps too, because it's very easy for us to just look through your repositories and go, oh, look, this guy, this is the guy that built Twitter Bootstrap, right? Or, or whatever you were working on. So all of this, once you get hired, we, sh we fly you back out to San Francisco from anywhere in the world, wherever you are. Um, we assign you a buddy, and ultimately your buddy is the person to sort of get you up to speed. Because just like everything else with happiness and everything, we care about your, your first run experience, just like we would care about onboarding you at github.com. So this applies for all hires, developers, designers, non-business types, or excuse me, business types, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the biggest thing that we do sort of is using Boxin. And so Boxin is another open source thing that we've developed. Um, it used to be called the setup. Ultimately, it's what sets you up to develop or design or do whatever you need to do. Um, on your first day. And so what happens when you join is you get a laptop or you bring your own, whatever, and then there's a URL that you go to, and we can automate the entire installation of everything you'll need to do, you'll need to develop for this company. So for us, that's usually Ruby and Image Magic and all this other stuff, right? Everything is installed. And so I got asked last time, uh, I, I talked about boxing, you know, how do you avoid doing the boring work that you just have to do every day? GitHub tries to automate everything. Once you've had to do it three times, it should be automated. And so for us, this is what Boxin looks like. So when I started, I go to, uh, you know, it's GitHub, whatever, whatever, with a script. And then I drop this in my shell. And then within 10 minutes, I have everything I need from a completely fresh Mac to, in, to working on GitHub.com. And so when I want to install act an actual project from GitHub, I can do Boxin GitHub or box in blah, blah, blah app, or box in Hubot. And that'll go, it'll pull down whatever I need. Hubot uses Node.js, so it's gonna make sure I have Node.js installed, installed if not, and then I'm good to go. Same thing with this, so this is just Ruby-based, but the same is true for a, for a bash script or whatever. Um, the, in every project we have, we have a script setup and a rake uh, setup update. And so what these do is, the, on the first run, maybe you need to have a database created that's seeded with some data. So you can do script setup. And then maybe you need to be able to keep that seed data updated. I can just do rake setup update. And that's all completely uh, taken care of. So this is an example uh, Boxin script. Boxin also allows me to have personal manifests. And so sure, github.com has a version of this, but this is mine. So this is what I need every day to be able to run you know, happily on my computer. And so, you know, Alfred, Chrome, Dropbox, you can kind of see my tastes. And so this is committed, and then every time I run Boxin, let's say there's a new version of Alfred, which is a um, sort of like a spotlight replacement if you're a Mac user. Um, it'll automatically catch that every time I run the Boxin command, and it'll update it on my computer. So it makes it very easy, especially when you're not all in the same office, to make sure everyone's sort of keeping up to date. Because when you're remote, it's impossible to try and like, herd a bunch of cats and say, hey, we're on Ruby 2.0 right now. Did you install that? You know, this is just going to take care of everything. And so the cool thing is, is at the end of the first day, I can deploy to GitHub.com, you know, which, which is really, really quite crazy as a new hover to be able to go in and look at an issue, run box in, and be boom, I can, I can commit. It also becomes a lot less scary to do that because you're not worried about spending a week setting up github.com and the hundreds of de you know, dependencies that it has. You can just, boom, run a command and you're ready to go. And so I think automation is huge for us. I think it's true 
I, th I think it's very rare if you do something more than three times, it's not worth the effort to automate it, whatever that is for you. So obviously happiness comes from our tools. You know, we build painkillers a lot. We initially used um, uh, Tender, which was a, a support tool by the creators of Lighthouse, if, if any of you guys remember that. Um, but now we ended up moving from that to help because it wasn't able to serve our needs anymore. Same thing with Hire, and then a Giants app, which I'm gonna show you at the very end. Um, we don't really start with an over-engineered solution, we just kind of move to it. Because it's important to make sure that we're happy. Everyone at the company should be happy. We shouldn't be stuck using a crappy tool because that's the only thing that's available. If that's the case, we'll build something on top of it. Because we use first principles for everything. We don't say we're not going to use Node, we're not going to use uh, PHP, we're not going to use everything. Every team decides what they need. And so what makes sense for us for now, in terms of operationally, a lot of apps are still running Heroku. Um, some apps run in Amazon EC2, and GitHub.com and other things run in uh, their own data center now. And so we didn't, everything doesn't get pushed to a data center because that hardware is the fastest and it's the easiest and, and whatever. For us, a lot of apps can just go live in Heroku. It's very easy to just get push Heroku, boom, done. The app's there. It's a small app. It can live there. And then as it needs to grow, we can move it on because that's just what makes sense for us. So we do continuous everything with Janky. What Janky is, is it's a Jenkins continuous integration server, something that's going to run your tests every time you do a git push and it talks to Hubot, which is our chatbot. So we can do continuous delivery. We test all of our code using unit tests and functional tests. So for us, it's RSpec instead of like PHP unit. Um, other teams on other teams at GitHub use test unit uh, or uh, mini test if you're Ruby fans. Um, we don't have QA teams though. Every team is responsible for both the design, functionality, and uh, integration of what they're building. So with Janky, we're able to set up our repositories from chat. So instead of having to go in and try to like deal with Jenkins, if anyone's ever used it, it's like a million fields to fill in. We just do a little command, and boom, it's done. Every single branch is tested automatically, so you don't have to worry about your feature branch only getting tested when it goes into master if you're building something off on the side. And then for GitHub.com users, you can have your continuous integration server update GitHub.com every time it builds. So for us, this is what that looks like. You can see on my team, it took 40 seconds for this, this to run, and it's gonna show me after every commit which commit caused the failure. So if, you, you, if you're a module builder or you use something that should be tested, um, if you can tie it into GitHub.com if you use that, uh, it's, it's pretty great to be able to see sort of where the break was and not, re not rely on Jenkins, which can be a little uh, touchy. And then when we want to deploy, we can deploy from chat like this. And again, anyone can do this because master's always deployable. Um, and so if I wanted to de deploy the finance after production, it's just this command. Some teams do continuous delivery where every time master passes, it just goes out to the servers. But most teams don't. They use something more like this. So at github.com, the site gets deployed about 50 times a day. Um, across all the internal apps at GitHub and external apps, um, we deploy over 100 times a day, all sort of automatically, which, is at, which was crazy to me when I joined. But it takes a lot of work to do this. But now we don't have to worry about a new hire coming in and sort of getting that like horrible experience where they do their first commit and the whole thing crashes. And you're like, well, why the hell did you do that? And it's not really their fault, right? There should be something that caught that and make sure that you know, there's not a dunce cap on the first day. We spend a lot of time on internal apps, which a lot of people kind of criticize us for. And I sort of, before I came here, I, I tweeted out, hey, what is, what's the one thing you want to know about GitHub? And I think there were three people that said, what the hell all the other 120 developers are doing at GitHub.com? It's because we spend a lot of time on internal stuff, stuff that makes our lives easier, and sometimes gets released to the public, right? Um, like, like Jekyll. Jekyll got released to the public. and so. The cool thing, I think, is that we don't really treat internal apps as separate from external apps. A lot of companies build like report tools. Like I imagine everyone here at some point, if you're a developer or a designer, had a business, a quote unquote business person come and say, I need XYZ reports. And you're like, all right. And you build a little page that shows how many hits everything got. And it kind of is just like, it's just crummy because you hate that you had to build this in the first place, right? And so at GitHub, the designers care just as much about the internal stuff as the developers do. And so there's no difference in how we design or build for an internal app versus github.com. The process is exactly the same. We care about the UX, we care about the design, the coding, everything's still tested. 
Um, a lot of them I can't show you because <laughs> they're internal nonetheless. But the one I got approved is the Giants app. And so if you're uh, familiar with San Francisco, San Francisco Giants have a baseball park, ATT Park, uh, a couple blocks down from github.com. And so this last year, GitHub got a suite for hubbers and for interviewees and for family. We can go see a game there anytime in the GitHub suite, right? And so in true GitHub fashion, we have to figure out how to like give out these tickets, right? And so this is some of the stuff that they put up in this suite. Like the illustrator said, you know what? We have to put signage up. And so somebody hand drew three or four of these OctaCat baseball guys. You know, the, some, one of the designers made uh, this, this awesome sign that shows like GitHub and all these different baseball things. And so this is the Giants app, right? We, we took a feed from Giants to say when all the games are, when it's a home game versus an away game. And then everyone that's orange is ultimately something that we uh, can go to. And there's so many tickets at every game. And so if I want to go to a game, I can go to this app, go in, click on a seat. It'll reserve the seat for me. And then I'll be able to go in and get the tickets from the office uh, to be able to pick them up. And this is all just like in some internal app. I can subscribe to an iCal feed for any game that I subscribe to. It'll automatically put it onto my calendar. And then they created a Instagram, uh, like a Foursquare Instagram location at the Giants Park for the suite. And so anytime you go there and you check in, it's going to stream all the Instagram photos here. And then those can also go into chat. So that way when there's a game, your friends are at the game, you can see what they're up to. And of course, if you were here yesterday with responsive web design, it's all completely responsive on both iPad and iPhone because the designers care. Because when you come into GitHub, there's a lot of times when, especially if you're an external employee and I fly in and maybe I come in at like five and I want to see if there's a ticket for the game, I can just do that from my phone, do it, pick up the ticket and go to the game. And so it's really neat. I mean, this kind of might seem frivolous to some degree, but it's a problem that we have. And this is how we solve a lot of problems that we can't sh I can't show all the apps that we do internally. There's team, there's this, um, there's other things that we, that we need to be able to operate effectively. So in summary, I think a lot of times we, we, we give up on culture when, when the going gets tough. You know, we give up on sort of what we agree on when someone's pressing us to do something much faster. And so I think it's really important that you as a team Obviously, we can't switch to everything immediately. But as a team, you understand what your culture is. And you should write it out. It doesn't have to be a crappy mission statement or anything silly that you did in the past. But you should be able to write out what's important to you. And the three things I mentioned are what's really important to GitHub. And hopefully, it shows to the rest of our products. You know, it's really important that the operations team, the people that are building the infrastructure, the designers, the developers, everyone's on the same page with this. Um, I think it's what makes GitHub special. It, we're betting on the fact that this is the way that companies are going to work as, the as time goes on. The fact that we do Git hosting is really cool, but this is what we really care about. Git hosting is an artifact of our culture, not the other way around, which is what I think a lot of people think. And so, you know, our hope is that this is going to be how a more companies work, because it makes it easier for us to hire remote and so on and so forth. But a lot of people that don't have remote employees, I'd love for if you have any questions or anything like that, that's something I'm really passionate about. This is something that uh, was internally in sort of our little mission statement. Um, never do something just because other people do it that way. Do it because it's the best way to solve the problem. I think that's really important. Um, you shouldn't just add a module or a gem in Rubyland or anything like that because that's what everyone else does. Make sure you care about what you're adding to your projects. Make sure when you design something, you care about that interaction. If it's a crappy gem or a crappy module, but it accomplishes what you need, you will, feel, you will feel that pain later. Maybe not now, but when you look at the code, you will. And so it's important that everything you add, it, it reflects on your opinions of, of your project, your app, your company. Obviously, this works for us. It may not work for you guys. It may not work for me in my previous lives. Um, but this is changing every day. What I showed you today may not be true tomorrow. It's been a five-year journey. A lot of things have changed at GitHub.com. But I think what we do is we want to make sure that we're making your lives easier by also making our lives easier. You know? And we're always iterating on uh, this entire process. So thanks. So I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has.
Sure. Uh, he asked what specific apps we use for campfire. So we use propane. Um, and uh, there's a JavaScript file that you, if you Google it, it's like caveat import or something like that. If you Google that, you can do a lot of cool stuff to your, um, your messages before they get sent or once they get sent back. And so you can actually manipulate them. And so a lot of the, like, the cool features that we have either come from Hubot or from our ability to adjust that JavaScript to maybe change. Um, if, if you do like emoji with colons, we can do um, our usernames with colons and it'll pull down the Gravatar and display that, for example. And that comes from the JavaScript stuff. Sure. Um, he asked, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you decide who gets a raise and doesn't, and how do you uh, deal with uh, um, uh, career uh, development and, and sort of so on, so on? So a lot of it comes down to at any point if I'm dissatisfied or I, uh, I want to move on to something new, um, I can always go to the founders um, and basically just say, hey, this is how I feel right now. Um, you know, I'm not happy with maybe my compensation or I'm not happy just being a developer. Maybe I want to be a designer or whatever. Um, a lot of that ends up going to the founders. And so the opposite is also true where the founders a lot of times propose things. And so for employee evaluations recently, there was sort of a proposal about how do we want to better get feedback and share that with the staff? And there was a proposal from the CEO. And during one of our weekly, um, they're called Beer 30s. And so after that, there's a markdown file, a gist. And then ultimately, the entire company goes in and will comment on what they think and what they, are, what they prefer. And it's kind of a, a rough rule that you should offer a suggestion. You can't just say, no, this is horrible. I hate this. You have to say what you think. And so the initial suggestion didn't end up going from the CEO didn't end up being sort of what happened. Um, it kind of got stopped, and, and there's going to be more discussion about it. And then the people that are passionate about it are the ones that ultimately have the most impact in making the change. So it's, it's pretty self-forming. No one's excluded, but you have to include yourself, which I think is a little bit different. Like instead of doing like an exploratory committee and like a corporate structure, this is more like, do you care about this? Like I care about getting feedback, but not to the point that I want to you know, carry, uh, uh, you know, push a rock up a hill, you know. Uh, but there are people that do. And so those are the people that get more say, though. And if, if what ends up from that sort of discussion isn't happy, it's all transparent. I can read the whole thing. It was my fault for not being a part of the conversation, I guess. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, at any point, we can go to the founders, you know, as sort of the, you know, the guys that have been there the longest, ultimately. Any other questions? I'm happy with anything. It could be even mean, too. Yeah, sure. Uh, what are the advantages that, uh, that developers face when they're working with the mm -hmm. uh, Same Sure. Um, the question was essentially, how, how do you make remote work for you, especially as probably a part of, of a bigger company? Um, I can kind of just say from my experiences more than anything, um, I'm a remote worker, um, you know, 40% aren't. And so for me, the biggest things are I follow my coworkers on Twitter, I follow my coworkers on Instagram. Um, that's kind of like as silly as it sounds, it's a great way to get a portal into what these people are doing during the day. Everyone's in chat, whether you're remote or not. There aren't conversations that happen outside of chat or pull requests or issues or anything. Literally everything ends up there. So you might have a conversation with a coworker at HQ, but ultimately when that's done, one of you has a responsibility to put that into a textual format that other people can consume. And I think that's what's lost in, in hybrid remote workforces is that they, even in all remote workforces, which I've done in the past, is you have a conversation with a coworker and you end up kind of like accidentally hating on the remote people because you're like, okay, it's just easier to talk to you. So what do you think about doing XYZ? And so while those conversations may happen, it's important that that information also goes into a gist, an email, an issue, whatever at github.com for us. Um, so that's probably the most, the most crucial thing, even if we do a Hangout, a Skype, or anything like that. Um, 
we, we, we really push back on synchronous. There's some things that you need to do synchronously, and there's no debating that at all. Creative work especially, if you're brainstorming or designing. And so those things usually happen in a Google Hangout or a Skype, um, or, or in a mini summit, or at a summit, or at HQ. But at the end of the day, we push back on synchronous almost everything. So I'm working on a finance team. We're talking to a lot of enterprise-y accounting software solutions, which, like, <laughs> I, I tweeted like two days ago, every time you email them, they're like, let's get on a conference line and here's my conference call, like every single time. And we will just say no. I mean, the CFO will say no, like we're just, we're not gonna have a meeting. And that kind of boggles their minds since CFOs quintessentially like to have conference calls. <laughs> and so it's important for us that we push back on that um, because it excludes people. And it's hard to have a conversation around something that isn't asynchronous, especially, for example, I'm here in Austin. I can't be at my computer all the time. Um, and so it's important for me to be able to still give feedback on that. Um, so I, I think that's the majority of it. I think the biggest thing is, is when you're working, think of all the times that your remote coworkers didn't get input. And then figure out how to give them that ability. Because that, that, I think, is what drives remote people away from a hybrid company. Because um, if it's all remote, it's not as big of a deal, but it's of a hybrid remote, then the hybrid people always get left out in some degree. And we struggle with that too. We're not perfect at that. Yeah. It's intense. <laughs> um, and that's probably the biggest struggle we have right now. Uh, in Campfire, you can star lines. And so if something important kind of happens, it's, uh, it's, it, it's kind of crucial that you star that kind of stuff. Um, so at GitHub, we've hacked the whole starring mechanism so that when someone stars, it, it stars globally. Instead of like now where in Campfire you click star and it's like for you, which is just the useless, most useless thing ever. Um, so that's one way that we do it in chat. Uh, there's team, which I showed a screenshot of. I read that every morning because it just gives, if something really important happened, it's gonna be there. Um, and then we have, I think, 768 repositories at github.com. And so I only do the one I'm working on and then five other ones. And those five other ones are usually the ones that are the newest stuff that's going on because those um, always reference the older stuff. You know, and so for me, there's some people that literally read every single email, like a guy named John Barnett, like it amazes me how he can listen to every single repository, but he'll respond to things that did not include him at all because he reads everything. For me, um, I, 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 would, I would explode. I would just shut off Sparrow, smash my laptop and call it a day. So I think you know, uh, a lot of it is, I always do the high bandwidth stuff first, like team, you know, and then all the little things that come in, I, I'm pretty picking choose. My personal project is a very small team, um, but most teams aren't that big, with the exception of obviously github.com. Um, so it's not, you have to pick and choose. You can't know everything. You have to assume that if it's big enough, um, you'll be mentioned into it or, or brought into the conversation instead of sort of like um, a lot of projects, especially in the consulting world, where you kind of have to keep up on everything because you never know when you're going to be brought in. Um, GitHub uses mentions pretty specifically uh, to be able to say, hey, Kyle, what do you think about this? I know, you're, I know you implemented um, such uh, the QuickBooks API or whatever, and then they can bring me into that conversation. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. How do people get fired? Um, it's not a surprise. <laughs> yeah, there's not an issue. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't speak as intelligently to this as, as maybe you, you would like. As far as I ha understand the process, uh, I mean, the founders are the ones that are involved and they'll probably take you aside and have a conversation about what sort of behavior is, is, is maybe trouble, you know? It may, like if you're working by yourself for three months on some silly project that doesn't add any value, you probably get brought into a conversation like that. Um, but aside from the literal process, I mean, I guess I can say there isn't like a repository for like potential people to fire and then they add like issues to that. It's not that transparent. It's transparent between the company and you. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a pull request. It's not a reverse pull request from the employee's repository. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Sure. 
Um, you know, to be, to be frank, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I wasn't there when the round happens. Um, I, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, uh, how, when we took, we took a round of financing a year ago, we got um, $100 million from Andreessen Horowitz. Um, and so he was asking how was that round sort of communicated amongst the company. Uh, I can tell you in similar situations since that um, it's similar to um, the employee um, evaluation proposal where this is what we're looking to do. We've done some due diligence on this. What do you think? Um, and so that's, uh, I'm assuming that's how the process was, but I can't specifically talk to it. Since then, um, they're very transparent on, you know, talking to us about that or f potential future moves that maybe as an employee I would want to know more about. Um, but sorry, I can't say anymore. <laughs> Anybody else? Awesome. I have a ton of stickers in and I have like other stuff too, so if you have questions where you didn't want to ask uh, in public, just come on up and I'm happy to hand some stuff out. Thank you everybody. <laughs>